So here's another ornery artist. Uh, I first uh, came to know John Gray before he put the McLaughlin in there. You gotta tell me why you did that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I first came upon him, um, was it at the Pass Me Rye? Bishop Pass Rye. Yeah, Billy Bishop Goes to War, one of the great theater pieces in recent Canadian theatrical history. He was the piano music-making half, along with Eric Peterson, of that wonderful piece. But he doesn't want to play. He doesn't want to do music. He wants to draw. Um, why he wants to draw, I'm not quite certain, because lately he's taken to writing writing. He, he's got columns going in national newspapers. He's got novels going. You finished one last week? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, he's ignoring me, so <laughs> why don't you carry on, John? No, go ahead, Moses. It's okay. Looks like the uh, flag of a small fascist dictatorship, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, there, I, when I was asked to do a, something about one's passion, uh, I, of course, in words, being into words, I suddenly realized that, of course, there's more than one word meaning to the word passion. On the one hand, you have passion as a sense of a, a, a heightened emotion, but you also have passion in the sense of a journey or a trial, the passion of our Lord and Savior. Um, and so I'm going to tell you the passion play, the little passion play of how I got from writing rhymes to uh, writing serial killer novels. I, I never wrote anything until I was uh, 30. And I think that my main problem was, had to do with the word creativity. And God created the heavens and the earth, the unmoved mover. The idea, what, this, what this translates into is it's coming from nothing into something. Or, and in which, what it translates in our puny universe of a person, that you, you become a kind of pump. You're taking something from inside and out she's going. And I, this, this never really worked for me. It's like trying to, trying to laugh. It's like trying to take a shit. It's just impossible, right? Try, the harder you try, the harder, the, the worse it gets. And so I never wrote anything other than letters and unsuccessful job applications until I was about, uh, until I was 30. And, and I'd been playing with rock and roll bands and I'd been working in theater and I, I, I'd, so I, I, it was the age of the songwriter and so I started trying to write songs. And I, in the act of rhyming, something happened. I'll give you an example. Well, I wasn't trying to write much. I mean, I was, I was trying to write songs, you know, like I love you, baby, songs, and sorry, baby, I got a ramble, songs, you know, anything like that. <laughs> but when you're in the act of rhyming, something happened. I'll give you an example. I'm looking for a rhyme for tuxedo. I rhyme is libido, right? Tuxedo, libido. Torn tuxedos. Worn libidos. Worn tuxedos, torn libidos. Suddenly we have an idea. And there was an idea there that wasn't there until the rhyme was there. It's not an idea that I pumped out of myself. It came from the rhyme. In other words, I'm talking about not creation, but recept receptivity, receiving something. The metaphor not being a pump, but an aerial. So I'm going to come to my, my little uh, drawing here, the, my, the, the flag of, uh, of uh, East Gray. East Gray. The, you have there an outer room and an inner room. And in the inner room, there's an eye, which I'll call the inner eye, but I don't know what it is. The star represents a guard, the guard. Everything that you see or hear gets in that door right there into the outer room. But the guard there decides what gets in to be seen by the inner eye. 
Now, on what criteria does he do that? Well, if you're from Presbyterian Nova Scotia, you've got a whole barracks full of guards. Everyone's guards are different, but basically, the guard is based on the word should, and the guard is based on what I've seen before. In other words, if all your guards are playing at the same time, you won't write anything because you won't see anything that you haven't seen before. So what rhyming, in fact, did, <clears throat> you can't beat the guard, I should say this. We all tried this in the 60s. People tried to beat the guard, and we didn't manage it. That's what the story of the 60s really is. The guard, you can't beat him, but you can distract him. Now, that's what the interesting thing about the rhyme, and that's what the genius of the sonnet was, the Petrarchan sonnet. In trying to fulfill the demands of a really very, very complex and demanding form, it in fact set people free. You'd look at it the other way around, but in fact set people free because it distracted the guard. Now, I, I, I wrote a, a number of musicals based on that simple, stupid, a little kind of realization. And they had a tremendous amount of rhyme in them because it, whenever I, I was stuck or when, whenever I wanted to get into the heart of it, I'd go to rhyme. And, and uh, in the, the first, in the 70s, late 70s and early 80s, with, uh, I, I had a number of hits or small hits, I call them hitlets. And what, what they brought me, uh, what I got out of my, my little string of hitlets, was a brand new guard, much bigger than the guards that came before. This guard was based on what you'd done before. You see, that's the wonderful thing about being a writer. Other, writer, other professions, you, get to, you compete with your competitors. With writing, you compete with yourself. Is it going to be as good as Billy Bishop? Are they going to like it as well as rock and roll? And these, this guard sort of sticks there, and it's, you just try writing like that, with this kind of cormorant sitting on your shoulder and going, no, no, it's not as good, it's not as good. <laughs> so I, 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 I uh, the, to, 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 to compound the problem, uh, any biologist, or I hope any biologist, I could be wrong about being a biologist, uh, but I'll just say that, that the natural uh, 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 order of any uh, cell or any organism is from simplicity to complexity. And that's the, that is how it is with the, uh, uh, with, with, uh, the, the brain, too. You, you can't stay simple. You, you naturally move to complexity. And if you're in the musical theater, that's the wrong way to go. So um, they, not only was they, so that naturally, because I was going to complexity, my musical started getting less and less successful, right? I started seeing this, right? And the cormorant got bigger and bigger. No, no, no. So that's when I turned to satirical writing. And I, 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 uh, you always get a little break, and you, you kind of follow it. And I got a break. I was in uh, a show called The Journal. Uh, it used to be a show when, the, when there was a, a journal, when there was a CBC. Uh, and, and, and I did satirical videos. It was the closest I ever came to having a job. Uh, I, I, I did 65 videos on 65 different contracts. And, and, and in the, act of, the actual kind of panic of trying to do videos try, in, a, in a week, write them and compose them and perform them and shoot them, uh, I, 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 the guard just didn't have time to deal with it. Uh, and, and, and so uh, uh, he just stayed out of there. Uh, the other thing was that I discovered in terms of the writing itself was that you can distract the guard another way, which is to make him laugh. Because you see, laughter is, <laughs> la laughter is, it's a, it's a form of truth recognition. It's an involuntary recognition of truth. A person laughs and they can't help it and they can't deny it. It's very much like throwing up. You can't say you didn't do it, you, you, you know? You did it, you know, it's there. You, 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 people heard you and saw you and you, you did recognize some truth to it, right? So I, I, I worked on that and that's what I'm still doing. I'm still with, with the columns and stuff. I'm still, uh, uh, I'm still trying to make the guard laugh and keep him out of there. But I was still left with, with the problem of, of, of complexity. But I wanted things to be more complex, or the guard wanted things to be more complex, and which is 
what got me uh, into writing uh, uh, novels. Um, I, it's pretty far with highest Luton for somebody who writes serial killer novels. I, 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 I don't know why. I don't know why there's, uh, these thrillers are happening, but uh, I can only kind of guess that it, it, it Presbyterian love little good evil parables or something, you know? And it, it, it satisfies my satirical bent because uh, I, I, my first uh, uh, thriller, A Gift of the Little Master, is about a, a, a serial killer who's gone into management. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, he, he manages and mentors the killings of others. And in so doing, he tries to, he turns them into serial killers themselves, you see. And so it's a little kind of parable or metaphor for how, uh, for example, in Germany in the 30s, how it was possible to turn weak-willed people and make them behave like psychopaths. So I, I but what I found writing novels, they're so complex. It's so hard to keep them together that you can not only distract the guard, you can drive him crazy. And yourself. I've been in a room for a year and a half writing the last one. That's why I'm nervous, I haven't been out. <laughs> but something funny happened. Something funny happened along the road, uh, writing a gift for a little master. I was riding my bike one day, and I was about three quarters of the way through it, and I kind of knew where I was going. Knew it, knew it, knew it kind of what was happening, had it all mapped out in my head, everything was okay. And I was riding and I suddenly realized the guy that I thought didn't, did it, didn't do it. <laughs> it was somebody else. <laughs> and it wasn't that I was saying, it'll work better if it's somebody else, or that if it's somebody else, it'll be cleverer or more interesting. It was like, it was just, it was somebody else. It was like, it was some, something that actually happened and I had discovered that it was somebody else. It's like you come across, come, come up on a car accident and you try to figure out from the little that you know what happened there, right? You know, you try to kind of reconstruct the accident. And it was like it already existed. And that's the weird thing that's happening to me now in the, in, in the, the fiend in human. I, 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 I'm, I'm getting more complex, you know. There we go. I was setting it in London, 1852, writing like Dickens. Oh, good. There we go. <laughs> there we go. And I go over it now, and I have huge, huge sections uh, that I, I can't remember writing. I can't remember writing them. And, and characters that I don't know where they came from. You know, you have that that weird thing, you know, when you're dreaming and you meet people that you know you've never met. Well, where did they come from if you haven't met them? <laughs> Fine, okay, that's okay, right. And, and so I come to a, my, I, I may be running short on most of it. This is an unusual thing. <laughs> so we come to a, 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 who is the guard? The question of who is the guard at the, at, at, at the gate? Can you put that up there? Who is the guard who prevents the inner eye from seeing uh, uh, what, uh, what is really there from being open to unfamiliar juxtapositions and new ideas and new stuff and not just the same old stuff and not the stuff that you're safe with and not the stuff you want to see and not the stuff that's positive. The, the, the tyranny of po being positive and looking on the bright side. And, mm. <laughs> so a guy named Julian Jaynes, a, a psychologist, wrote a, 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 a wonderful book uh, with a catchy title. It goes, <laughs> The origin of, con uh, of origin of Consciousness in the Decline of the Bicameral Mind. And what he theorized was, died in PEI, interesting, huh? Uh, he, he theorized that uh, preliterate, the difference between preliterate man and us is actually physical that the development of writing actually changed the brain physically. That uh, by, he called bicameral, the ca bicameral mind, if you look at any uh, of the uh, preliterate texts, the Iliad or the early texts of the Bible and stuff, you'll find that nobody thinks, nobody makes decisions. That what happens instead is they hear a voice. And so James had, had and, and I'll go, and, and, I'm not, I can't go on and on about this, but 
But James uh, talked about how uh, uh, the way the bicameral mind worked was that it's like, you know, you're driving the car. Well, the part of you that's driving the car is doing one thing, and you're also listening to the radio to distract somebody else, right? That other part of you that's bored, right? By driving the car that doesn't have to think for doing that, okay? Well, you distract that other part of your mind just to the one who's driving the car. That's how uh, bicameral mind worked until there was a decision to be made. A truck comes across on the highway, and you need to put on the brakes, and you need to stop. And instead of where we would go, oh, yes, stop, you know, put on the brakes. Instead of doing that, right, bicameral mind, heard a voice, and he called that voice God. Now, as people learned to write, the act of writing created ganglia in between the two sides of the brain that integrated the two, so that instead of hearing voices, we do what we call thinking. And instead of hearing what we call God, we hear ourselves. And he talks about this as a development in terms of uh, of, of uh, a forward development, and I wonder, and I wonder, because I wonder which is the illusion, right? I mean, I wonder if, uh, because, you know, the Greek oracles, he talked about the Greek oracles as being the sign that it was disappearing, that only certain people could hear the voices now. Other people couldn't. And maybe the oracles were hearing the voices. Maybe everybody was once hearing the voices. And we don't now. Instead of hearing God, we hear ourselves or what we think are, is ourselves, but is really the guard. The irony of writing, uh, for me, is that you're trying to use the problem to solve, to, to solve the problem with the problem. <laughs> You've got, you know, writing is the problem. That is what created this situation, and writing will get us out of it, or get me out of it. And I don't know you. <laughs> I, and in, in the sense that uh, by, by these torturous strategies for distracting and in doing things with the guard, uh, in wrestling with forms, the entire creation of these forms, from the sonnet to the screenplay to, it, to the narrative structure to the story, all those are are. are, are attempts of writing to solve itself. And that, even though I only write screenplays, that um, the uh, stuff that I do, that I in the center there, uh, that I that um, uh, I'm going for, uh, that's the closest I'm ever going to get to God. Thanks.